I'd like to welcome you uh, on behalf of Canon Automation to our today's webinar, uh, which is intended to present the um, proceedings from the 17th International CAN Conference uh, that we had unfortunately to postpone. So, um, one remark at the beginning, uh, this webinar is going to be recorded. So, by participating in the webinar, you agree that the organizer is allowed to take pictures and recordings and you authorize the distribution of the video recording via the internet or other communication channels without compensation. So much with regard to the formal things. So um, me, Rainer Sitzmann and Holger, we will guide you through this webinar and <laughs> it's a rather special webinar. It looks like more than a <laughs> board of directors meeting with some guests. <laughs> so, but nevertheless, uh, a warm welcome also to our directors. Um, briefly, to us, so the presenters, my name is Rainer Sitzmann from Can Automation. I hold a degree in electrical engineering from the University Erlangen Nürnberg. And I've been working as a general manager of Canon Automation, GmbH. And um, in addition to managing uh, the office here from Can Automation, I represent Can Automation also in international standardization. Um, at the moment, we are engaged with the project of uh, defining can open to accompany the charging process for light electric vehicles. And additionally, I standardized uh, can open also in the uh, field of rail vehicles. So there, I introduced can open as a consist network. And additionally, I accompanied the standardization process of can open on ten level. So for usage of can open in garbage truck applications. And furthermore, I'm registered in further mirror groups on German and European level. And Olga, would you like to introduce yourself? Yes, I can do. Uh, I'm uh, one of the originators of the CIA organization. And uh, this was done in 1992. So since more than uh, 25 years, I'm working now for CIA. And um, you see that I have also some background in standardization. And um, I will guide you through the, some of the sessions today and summer, uh, provide summaries on that. So, but at first, I think Rainer will give you some general introduction to the CIA organization. Yeah. Very briefly, as uh, many of the attendees are also uh, running Canon Automation Association, representing Canon Automation Association as officials. So we can keep this in brief, but um, nevertheless, we have some attendees that maybe not that familiar with Canon Automation. So briefly, why is Canon Automation doing something like that and organizing something like an international CAN conference? So Canon Automation was founded to um, make people aware of CAN, of the controller area network, to bring CAN in various application fields and to indicate that uh, the controller area network is an attractive candidate for embedded networking in various application fields. And this means on the one hand, CAN in Automation does some marketing with regard to CAN. On the other hand, CAN in Automation wants to assist people that have some challenges in their project, some CAN related challenges, so that they can come to CAN in Automation and can ask their questions and maybe we can try to help them further directly or at least we can rely on our big social network with at the moment about 670 member companies. So at least we can rely on them, on their expertise and we can help you then and answer your can related questions within 24 hours hopefully. So you see um, here the membership uh, development of Canon Automation. At the moment, uh, we are roughly at about 670 member companies. We have a more or less constant growth since uh, the founding in 1992. So we see, despite that there are a lot of other um, communication techniques in the marketing window, um, this development shows that CAN is still a very attractive candidate for embedded networking on the one hand. Um, on the other hand, it shows that also CAN and automation, the association, 
um, of uh, the social network and for many uh, companies and uh, experts also very attractive being part of the social network and having therefore the possibility to stay in contact with CAN experts and to accelerate therefore with their projects in case of some challenges. So CAN Automation itself is located in Germany, in Nuremberg, uh, very close to the city center. So in normal times, let's say in times uh, not infected by Corona, there are uh, two uh, very interesting fairs for our market, the Embedded World and the SBS fair. And so it's for us very good staying here in Nuremberg, having contact to all the major players in the field of embedded networking and to stay in touch with them. And therefore, on the other hand, if you come here for the fair, for example, there's also the possibility to come to Canon Automation Office and discuss your issues, your can related ones. And you see here the contact addresses and at least for those coming from abroad, they can write us an email, give us a call and so on. Briefly to the activities of Canon Automation, on the one hand, we try to do some marketing for CAN and CAN related things. So this means we think in which kind of application fields it is uh, relevant to place information about CAN based networking to inform how could we meet some requirements, some challenges with regard uh, to embedded networking, CAN based embedded networking, how is it beneficial to use CAN in a certain application field, in a certain application. And this we do typically together with some marketing groups under patronage of Canon Automation, where we develop some demonstrators, where we decide on which exhibition should we go and should present there the um, attributes of Can, on which events, conferences we should place, presentations we develop, um, some image videos or provide can based content in other languages to overcome some language barriers to decision makers. So, um, if you want to be a part of this uh, kind of marketing, then we would appreciate uh, your contribution there and you could benefit from being a part of this CAN community. There are a lot of technical issues that will be discussed by these proceedings, which are going to be presented in the next roughly 45 to 60 minutes. Um, are also addressed by technical working groups. These technical working groups are managed by the technical committee. So the technical committee decides where are can is can automation starting some work and where some technical standardization work required. And this technical committee manages these several working groups, so-called special interest groups. Um, in the past, we had a lot of work there with regard to can open defining how can we give a CAN-based device a certain degree of plug-and-play capability in an embedded application field. And now, uh, since a couple of years, their CANFD came up, and therefore we thought, how can we map these advantages derived by the usage of a CANFD-based data link layer to CANOPEN, and we developed CANOPENFD. And we founded a new working group, the IG Can Open FT, where we will hear about some results also in the proceedings of the International CAN Conference. Furthermore, we maintain a lot of profiles thinking about certain device classes, how they manage their data for a certain device class or for a certain application field. Also, here, if you're um, somehow affected by a certain um, work field that is addressed by such a working group, then it would be great if you enter up um, this working group and maybe on a guest status and you have a look what's going on there, how do the people work there, what are they standardizing, Is are all these requirements um, that you have in your device development, system development, are they addressed by these um, working groups? Do you think it would be wise to add there some input? Then we would appreciate any input from your side and having you as a member in our CAN community. You see here there are coming also some very new topics, for example, the CAN XL, which will be also addressed now by the proceedings. So will be maybe a future candidate, a next generation of CAN-based networking, a very big active group. So Holger is now coming immediately from a meeting there from the XL group. And on the other hand, we have 
non-CAN related topics now facing the embedded world of CAN based networking, safety and especially security. And also here we will see some presentations uh, or hear about some presentations in the proceeding of the International CAN Conference. So, in general, we try to assist developers in using CAN by these uh, CAN specifications developed and maintained by these working groups. And we would appreciate also if, uh, to, to welcome you as a new member of these working groups if you um, think that they are valuable for you. And at least you can come there as a guest and meet us and discuss with us your CAN related issues. Yeah, so much briefly with regard to CAN and automation. For those um, who are not that familiar with Canon Automation, and then let's come to the topic of today, um, the presentation of the International Can Conference proceedings. As far as I've already told you, unfortunately, due to the appearance of the coronavirus, we had to postpone the International Can Conference. Uh, we think this will be. Uh, is now the next year because at the moment nobody can give any reliable forecast um, when we can go back to a normal mode out of this uh, corona emergency mode. So nevertheless, we could save all the valuable information um, that should have been presented in March on the conference in Baden-Baden. And I tried now to assemble here a kind of a split screen. On the right hand, you will see, the, the, or you should see, the proceedings. On the left hand, which I prepared some slides together with Holger to guide you a little bit through these proceedings, to present you through these proceedings. Um, at the beginning, two things, please, to remember. On the one hand, Holger and me, we are not the experts that have submitted these presentations and these papers, so we try to give just an introduction, but for the very deep technical details, then please refer to the authors of these uh, white papers. On the other hand, once again, special thanks to the sponsors of the International CAN Conference, the companies Emotas, ESD, GMAC, Peak, and Vector, um, who acted as sponsors for these uh, for this International CAN Conference, and they which supported also to widespread the information on the latest development of CAN and to enable these kind of events. So, so, so much uh, for opening this webinar. So I think then, Holger, you will start with um, the first content. Yes, I will start. Uh, good uh, evening from my side. And um, you see that the ICC conference was structured by means of sessions. Uh, we will not follow this sessions approach uh, in our presentation today. We will uh, move uh, just on topic-wise and not on session-wise, but uh, there's an exception with the keynote by Volkswagen. Carsten Schanze uh, presented or would like to present in his uh, paper uh, that uh, it starts always, that what I like to call a patchwork network. So you have a CAN network, you have an additional CAN network, you have a LIN network and other network technologies and all step by step, like in a patchwork, you would add this. At some time, uh, at some point in time, this was not more uh, suitable to design it in that way. So then the automotive industry uh, started to uh, develop the approach of, um, of another uh, thing. It's uh, more or less domain oriented. This was a, a logical functionality of the, doc uh, of the networks. You have then uh, a network for the body electronics, for the uh, power train, for the telematics, uh, and so on. Unfortunately, uh, such a logical approach um, is not optimized regarding the length of the cable. So with increasing number of ECUs, and we have today about uh, several hundreds in high-end cars, uh, this uh, costs a lot of cabling. And cabling means weight. And weight means uh, CO2 pollution. And this is what the automotive industry like to avoid. So the new approach is now, or what is coming in the future, is the sonal architecture. This is that you have, so to say, an infrastructure in your application, could be a car, could be a truck, could be any other application. And um, in the backbone, 
connecting all the different locations. You see here in the picture from Volkswagen, you have a front left uh, zone, you have a, right, uh, a front right zone, a back left zone and a back right zone. And in the middle, there's a high performance computer connecting all these front end networks. Of course, the high bandwidth is not, uh, cannot be uh, satisfied by means of, of a K network. This will be in most applications, something like 100 megabit ethernet or even higher. Nevertheless, in the, in the different zones, there is uh, just less bandwidth required. And there could be uh, a 10 megabit ethernet uh, be used as a backbone in the different zones. And maybe also sometimes the total uh, backbone can be used by a 10 megabit uh, network. And uh, this is what uh, Volkswagen has in mind for the low end cars. Uh, and for the high end cars, of course, they will use some ethernet based communication. This is uh, his paper and he, uh, and, uh, because of this uh, approach, this zonal approach, you need a high scalable uh, network technology. Ethernet provides today 100 megabit and 1 gigabit, and maybe in the future 10 megabit, and CAN comes from the other end, from the uh, 500 kilobit via CAN FD with 2 and 5 megabit, and then with CAN XL about 10 plus megabit per second. This is, fits quite good into the uh, picture of um, Mr. Schanze, uh, and I talked also to other OEMs in China and in other parts of the world. They all appreciate this kind of future zonal architecture. And um, of course, uh, in the subzones, there will be a, a CAN and a LIN and a CAN FD and CAN XL be used. And uh, to be honest, um, a classical CAN uh, sometimes already substitutes uh, traditional LIN networks, and so it goes a step down. Uh, and CANFD is used uh, for uh, higher performance applications, and uh, then CANXL could be a small backbone in the zones or in the subzones, and uh, the high bandwidth uh, requiring. Uh, overall back, uh, backbone, this is connecting then the different subzones. This is the paper and uh, giving some details also by Mr. Schanze in his presentation. You see that they will use in the future only CANFD and uh, uh, CANXL and uh, Volkswagen was also one of the initiator of the CANXL development. Okay, questions up to here. Have you one thing, tell you evaluate which kind of questions you like to ask. Um, you can also use the chat, which is open and will be monitored by us. So and we can also consider your questions directly during the speech. Okay, if there's no question, then we can uh, go further. Uh, the first thing I have summarized on this slide, all mechanics air related topics that are the uh, papers from Florian Hartwig uh, describing in, in detail uh, the uh, CANXL approach, as well as some implementation issues in the IP course. Um, not to go in any detail, uh, but CANXL provides a payload of 2048 bytes. So this is comparable to, to Ethernet. And it splits that what is known from the CAN, from the classical and the CAN FD business, the identifier is now split into a field of priority and another field which indicates then what is uh, the content of the data. The content of the data will be described by, by means of a payload type as who are familiar with that uh, in ethernet, this is similar to, ether, uh, to an ether type. So this is a, a very interesting approach so that we still keeping those things which are benefitable from the CAN world but still we are also adapting things as they are used in the Ethernet world. What is one of the big uh, differences is the kind of uh, reliability and measures uh, to protect that. We have split the CRC in two parts. 
and one part uh, is uh, protecting the so-called header and the other one the entire frame. So this cascaded uh, CRC allows us uh, to uh, detect nearly any error, but this will be done, uh, will be discussed in more detail in the paper from Mr. Mutter and Mr. Sanger from the University in Stuttgart. Uh, still, there are some open issues in the CanXL protocol, which Florian described. Um, we are still thinking how to integrate a data link layer security and how we optimize some bits, but the general approach is already clear. Uh, we are still uh, in discussion with some details. Uh, interesting is also that the implementation is not that easy, uh, but uh, Florian described some of the challenges how to implement IP cores, and uh, they have done some prototypes in Bosch, and it looks like it is uh, not that difficult to implement that. Let's go to the paper from Dr. Mutter from uh, Bosch also. Yeah. Uh, he is describing the error detection capabilities of, uh, of CanXL. There are some critical bits in the classical CAN and in CANFD, which uh, uh, lead to some shortcuts in the reliability. So we can't achieve uh, by means of these kind of stuff, bit, uh, stuff bits and, and other measures um, a, a, a best reliable protocol. Nevertheless, in CanXL, we have overcome all those uh, issues. And he described this in detail in his paper. This is um, it's not so academic, but is interesting for all people who are dealing with uh, reliable communication. And uh, I think uh, this is a really a um, big advantage uh, compared with uh, Ethernet networks. Uh, let's have a short discussion on uh, Mr. Sanger's paper. He is uh, looking to the uh, CRC error detection, which is provided uh, in the CAN protocol, in the CANXL protocol. As I mentioned, we have now two CRCs and they are cascaded. He describes in all details uh, what is the benefits and what they have uh, researched on these CRCs. And the CRCs uh, provide uh, uh, a, hamming a true hamming distance of six without any uh, short cam. Uh, this means uh, we can detect any five randomly distributed bit errors. This is better than any other protocol which I know. Uh, we will also go from the CIA point of view, we will uh, hire a second university to prove these research results because we want to see that this is not just uh, done by one uh, party, we want to have this double check by another party and we are in negotiating in the moment uh, which university is uh, doing the uh, double checking of these uh, CSC error detection capabilities and also we would like to have uh, the uh, value for the um, remaining uh, capability, uh, 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 residual error capability. What is this? This is needed maybe for some safety uh, applications and to have some knowledge also for security. Okay, uh, this is a this is just logic. This is uh, just a data link layer and and above. Uh, the challenge is also to have a physical layer running at ten megabit per second, uh, and the requirement from the automotive industry is that this should be the, to nearly the same cost as for CAN-FD and, and classical CAN. So in the moment we have two different approaches available. Uh, one is uh, uh, proposed by Bosch and the other one is proposed by NXP. And uh, Magnus Maria Hell describes in his paper the challenges which we have, what we have to, to fulfill. Uh, both of these approaches seems uh, to, to be good enough to fulfill all the requirements. And we have to make now our decision uh, in the CI working groups which uh, approach we like to go. Uh, we think that uh, one approach uh, would be uh, uh, 
not better than the other one. We think they are similar. They have always diff, uh, advantages and disadvantages. Um, from the price point of view also, I think that they are comparable. Um, and a third option, which we are also discussing, is to have an extra line to communicate between the uh, CAN controller, CAN XL controller, and the transceiver chips. This is necessary to uh, understand in which mode you are, because this is the approach is in general a du dual mode approach. So we have two different modes of the transceiver chips in the arbitration phase as well as in the data phase when we're running 12 megabit per second, uh, or even more uh, if possible, depending on the network topology. And this is a uh, but this is something what the automotive industry does not like because they want to have these uh, scalability also in respect to the uh, transceiver chips. And so they need to be pin compatible and we can't use, and we don't want to use an extra pin for the communication between CanXL controller and transceiver chip. This interface looks like it's, it's not that complicated as in Ethernet. You know that Ethernet controllers and uh, transceiver chips have a complicated interface. We uh, call our interface here Mickey, uh, and this will be a, a, a simple one, but still there is an interface uh, which is more complex than for CAN-MD and uh, for classical CAN. The, other paper is uh, how to, uh, to, to design a 10 megabit in vehicle networks by Patrick Eisensee from the CNS group. They have done a lot of research for KNFD and they use their knowledge gained uh, for some uh, projects with the automotive industry, how to design those networks. And he summarizes uh, here, what is, are the challenges and what they need to, to do for that. We make some, we use some ideas of FlexRay because there's also a 10 megabit uh, communication system and we use, make use of some Ethernet things and we try to avoid that it is uh, that complicated as uh, in Ethernet. So at, at the end, then the chips will be cheaper. So you see that he has uh, given here some uh, uh, issues uh, also regarding the EMC and uh, EMI problems and uh, this is also a good paper uh, for a, a, a theoretical background to get an idea what you can achieve and what you can't achieve. Beside these lower layers, there's also two papers uh, on the, uh, in the ICC proceedings regarding the higher layer. One is how to use IP concepts on CanXL. And I'm coming just from the working group who's responsible for that. Peter Decker is uh, the um, task force leads up with that. And he proposes an IP concept uh, on CanXL. So this means tunneling and uh, of CAN uh, FD frames and how to use some IP also in CAN networks. This is done in, in some details and still we like to, to do uh, some more specification uh, in the CIA documents, which are in the development. And um, the uh, main issue is uh, how we can uh, address those bridges and uh, other things and we are still in, in development of that. Uh, so it's not finalized yet. In my paper, uh, I presented a multi-PDU concept. The multi-PDU concept is for heterogeneous backward, backbone networks. Uh, the idea is like in Outrasar that you use the large payload of 2048 bytes to transmit different um, applications in one frame. So this means if you, have, for example, have in one of the zone a small sensor for one application and another sensor for another application and a third sensor for another application, they are running three different application layers or different uh, protocols. Maybe uh, some, one is using just uh, for diagnostic and the other one is used for uh, repair information and the other one is used for uh, the operating um, transmission of sensor values. They can, can on the backbone, which on the CanXL backbone, they can be uh, uh, mapped into one frame. 
because we have 2048 bytes and most of the sensors don't need that uh, much um, uh, that, uh, that, uh, that much information or that much data. Uh, so we can optimize the overhead uh, regarding the, uh, the protocols. And this would be a very efficient way to transport this by means of a huge uh, frame to another zone uh, or another uh, subzone. And um, here I have presented some of these issues, what you can do and what we are already doing, but not in a proper way. As the patchworking of the networks, we have done the same with patchworking of higher layer protocols. We add some new functions in this protocol, in this protocol, in this protocol. The same is also in non-automotive applications. If you think about uh, construction machines, uh, we have J9039 and can open. Today we have separate networks meaning a lot of cabling, but we also can use this in one network running in parallel different application layers on the same cable. I described this multi-PU concept in my paper there, and uh, there's also already some uh, framework uh, how to design that. Uh, this is done in some ISO documents from the last decade, or no, for, from the last century. Okay, and um, uh, we can reuse all these uh, basic ideas and uh, then uh, specify this in one of the CIA documents. Are there questions to the CANXL approach, which uh, is mentioned in the, uh, uh, in the ICC proceeding? You see there's a lot of papers there with a lot of details, but I think uh, that if there are questions, I can answer them. It was not in the chat, so I'm, I think we, we can proceed. We can proceed. If, if nobody's asking, then you can ask me also at the end, we will have a, a question session. Okay. So then you have a short break, Olga. <laughs> I take over a little bit. Um, we had also some can open, can open a few related papers in the um, ICT proceedings. One from uh, Mr. Wilhelm from Peak, together with uh, Chris Keidel, um, talking about a simplified classic can open to can open FD migration path using smart bridges. Then Ms. Yao from Canon Automation, she presents can open FD device identification via new layer setting services. Uh, Mr. Philip from company Emotas. He um, provided a theoretical approach for node ID negotiation in can open networks. Mr. Mark Schwager from Vector, he presents a new approach for simulating and testing can open devices. Mr. Kaplun, also from Canon Automation, he provides an overview about can open FD conformance testing. And finally, in this section, um, Dr. Heike Saha from TKI. He presented automated workflow for generation of can open system monitoring graphical user interface. So let's have a look into the uh, white paper from Mr. Wilhelm. So he is discussing um, the issue that classical CAN and CAN FD that they are not really backward compatible. So as long as a KNFD based device is issuing classical CAN frames, then you could have heterogeneous architectures where classical CAN based devices and KNFD based devices can uh, coexist and can be even interoperable in the very same network on the very same wire. But as soon as a KNFD based device issues a KNFD coded frame, then you have to take some measures to protect the classical CAN-based devices from seeing this CAN-FD frame. So you see this here in a short picture, and exactly this is discussed in the paper from Mr. Wilhelm together uh, with Chris Keidel and Olaf Pfeiffer. And you have several possibilities now to deal with this situation, to combine CAN-based devices and CAN-FD-based devices to pass CAN-FD-based devices um, away into the future. So they say, okay, I can develop CAN-FD-based devices now and I can integrate them to existing systems. How can there be a migration path? And one option is 
to use some kind of gateway applications, some kind of smart bridges where you separate between classic CAN based devices, classic CAN open devices, and on the other hand, CAN open and D devices. And then they evaluated um, with regard to these devices, okay, what about the services? So there may be services which allow a simple forwarding, so a boot up message, a sync message, uh, emergency of classical style and a PDO that it does not exceed the 8 by length barrier. They can be simply forwarded. And they are describing a smart bridge based on uh, boot up messages, for example, or heartbeat services, error control services, such as smart bridge can learn. Which devices are attached on which side? What is my network architecture? What is the topology? And can provide them the corresponding functionality. Um, by the way, a lot of this functionality is already described by a document that is called CIA 302-7. For example, to deal with issues, what if you use on a CAN FD based site PDOs or frames that are longer than 8 bytes that exceed the 8 byte threshold value and then you need some kind of remapping, you can do this also according to document CIA 302-7. Um, they describe this more or less in a proprietary way and furthermore they are discussing what about um, the SDO handling. Of course the SDO, the UU SDO in a can open FD site has a full coverage of the classical SDO so you can set up also on a can open FD site confirm point-to-point -point connections, you can access any attribute, any data for data object in the device object dictionary of a can open a D device. So in this direction, it is rather simple translation from SDO to USDO. What they are pointing out as well in their presentation is that of course the USDO has a lot of more functionality so this means you have more powerful command, commands that have to be um, um, implemented or uh, resolved on the can open side in several SDO transfers. So for example, we have in can open FD uh, a multicast session, a broadcast session. So this means or this requires several SDO accesses till the result is available on the can open FD side. So this they are discussing in their paper about uh, the smart can open FD bridge and they also talk about the availability that they have this already available in the implementation uh, based from the peak system. Uh, furthermore, we have now a presentation about can open FD uh, submitted by Ms. Yao from Can Automation. We can have a short look on that. So, Ms. Yao deals with the issue, what about assigning devices with a node ID value? So, you know, in open every device requires a node ID value. And we have now the challenge, how can we solve this issue to provide several unconfigured devices with a unique node ID value? So, I provide here a small slide uh, presenting for those that are not that familiar with this issue, the problem you may have several devices out there that are not configured and you have to address now exactly one and to tell this device, hey, you should now get node ID value 10. And in classical can open, we do this by that way that we use, for example, the layer setting services. They exist, for example, the command LSS switch state selective. And by calling this device now by the vendor ID, the product code, the revision number and the serial number, this device knows now, okay, hey, it's me, I'm addressed now, and I shall take this uh, node ID value. And in the presentation by Ms. Yao, she presents um, the status more or less of the working group, uh, SIG Layer Setting Services FD. So how can we do this mechanism in an improved way based on CAN FD? And this I illustrated briefly here. They say, okay, why not using the big payload provided now by a KNFD frame, for example, in putting all this information in a single frame and saying, hey, this device with this so-called LSS address is addressed and shall at the end get this node ID value. And 
What he's also discussing is that we can accelerate a scanning process if the content of the object 1018, the identity object, is not available, is not known by the LSS master, then we have at the moment in classical Canopy the problem that we have to do some scanning. There exists an old-fashioned mechanism, there exists an at the moment state-of-the-art mechanism that is called the LSS fast scan service. But nevertheless, there's some space to improve. And with the capabilities provided by KNFD, she introduces now the status of this working group LSSFD, where devices can, in certain shares, identify themselves by informing the master application in case of a scanning about the next middle of their LSS address. So I had here a short uh, picture inside, uh, inserted where you see maybe this blue part of the LSS address is already known to the LSS master and all devices that take part currently in the scanning cycle and match with this part, the blue part of the LSS address, they confirm that they um, match with this part of the LSS address and in addition they provide in the CAN identifier of their response the next nibble of, this LS, of their LSS address and therefore LSS master gets the information hey, in which direction do I have to scan for getting the next unconfigured device, the LSS address of the next unconfigured device. And this she is describing and she is also describing how you can accelerate with this mechanism um, the scanning process so that can detect a new device within about 350 milliseconds. So, so much with regard to the presentation from Ms. Yao. A presentation in a similar direction we get from Mr. Philip from company Emotas. So he's also dealing with the issue um, how can devices get their node ID value? For a moment, I just want to show you the paper. So, he is um, addressing in his uh, speech more or less the same issue with one exception that he says we have now a lot of um, modern applications where not a dedicated system designer assembles the system, but maybe the end user. You have not necessarily a uh, can open trained system designer. And furthermore, you have not necessarily a master available in the system. And how can we create dynamical node ID assignment in such circumstances? And Therefore, he describes in his paper a solution, a theoretical approach. It's not yet part, I think, of any CAN automation working group. Um, but he did some considerations and he presents this in his paper where he said, okay, a device has to be able to transmit the classical um, CAN frame in an extended frame format, the 29-bit identifier, and it's not a requirement that a master is available. We describe here a mechanism that works also by absence of the NMT master. And then he's combining more or less um, functionality that might be aware from J9039 address claiming or from can open node ID or node claiming procedure. And he says, okay, we can take the 29-bit identifier and map there some information from the identity object in the identifier and transfer it directly. So we see this here in his paper, the can ID usage. He uses from the 29-bit identifier um, the lower 8-bit for providing some information from the object 1018. And in the next four bits, he describes, he declares, the content, which part of the ID do we transfer. So this means they start this uh, transfer process and all the devices that do not own a node ID value yet, a valid one, then they are synchronized by this message and then they start um, a kind of address claiming procedure and that device that succeeds because of the of its priority to send all its messages because that device that loses the cause of its priority and is not able to send its message, then 
um, that device has succeeded at the end in sending all its messages, its entire content of object 1018, this device claims then a node ID, announces this in the network, and then all the remaining devices can continue this address claiming. Also, some ideas are in this paper with regard to node ID conflicts, and this is described, as I said, in the paper from Mr. Phillips. Furthermore, we have two presentations dealing with um, conformance testing. The first one is from Mr. Schwager from Company Vector. So he is talking about new test concepts for improving can open device quality. So he's addressing the issue that can open device testing is very important to increase the probability that devices or can open devices are interoperable and that they are working more or less out of the box. So he is talking um, in a way that says, okay, can open conformance testing offered by can automation. This is a very good base, but we say it's a rather static testing. So we are testing whether the state machine is implemented correctly, the services are working correctly, but we have not the ability to test performance, for example. Um, furthermore, we do not test the application, the application behavior of a device. This is also important, of course, so that a device gets a certain degree of plug and play capability. We at Can and Automation try to do something like that in our plug fest approach or the approach of interoperability tests. Um, of course, we cannot uh, do this for all the possible application fields. And now um, he is presenting, based on the vector toolchain, some possibilities how this application testing and so-called upper testing could be possible in an automated way. So that you have virtual network partners, devices that can be simulated based on the electronic data sheet, based on the information derived from the electronic data sheets, and that you. Uh, develop uh, corresponding test scripts, test scripts that are using plain text variables. So if you want to reuse your tests, then you don't have to rewrite all the tests in case there are some indices changing, some information is residing on other indices. So all this is now described in his paper and how these um, tests can be automated and can be provided in an efficient way. This is provided by um, Mark Schwager, mainly based on Ken Oakland. Now, um, to show the past into the future, there we have the presentation from Mr. Kaplun from Ken and Automation. And uh, Mr. Kaplun provides a um, presentation about Ken Open with deconformance testing. On the one hand, what is the status today? that we provide a software tool which is available free of charge for Canon Automation members. They can download it from the Canon Automation website, can test their can open implementation, can discuss the results with uh, CI engineers where or how to improve their devices. On the other hand, companies can use this test tool to check are these devices that are uh, that they have purchased, do they really uh, are they really conform to the can open specification. This conformance test tool is based on the electronic data sheet. So it learns all the information from the electronic data sheet and then performs the corresponding test steps. Um, Mr. Kaplun gave us a short insight where is our where resides our test tool, how is um, test device testing considered to be considered in general, which uh, test coverage does our test tool have, and what are additional tests like upper tests and so on. And furthermore, from the status quo, he shows the way into the future that Canon Automation is currently enabled to provide tests with regard to Can Open FD devices based on a test procedure. So we uh, can automation test engineers can go with a sheet of paper and can verify more or less if this or that can open FD attribute um, available and implement it correctly. Um, in the future, we want to have this in an automated way. Therefore, uh, Canon Automation with the working groups 
is working on a can open with the test tool, which uh, tests all the services pro defined in can open FD specification. In conjunction to this, we need, of course, the XML-based device description, the device description files, and a way to test them. So this is currently defined by the corresponding Canon Automation Working Groups and presented the status and the way and the plannings within Canon Automation in this paper by Mr. Kaploon. And finally, we have um, a presentation in this section provided by Mr. Saha. Mr. Saha from TK Engineering. He introduces an automated workflow for generating of can open system monitoring graphical user interfaces. So this automated workflow um, intrinsically supports iterative development and efficient information reuse. He addresses in his paper also uh, the challenge that can open does not really provide um, the location of the devices. So, for example, if you have two batteries in your Pedelec, you don't know which is the right one, which is the left one. From the device itself, you don't get this information. So, therefore, he has already introduced a little bit longer ago uh, something that is called a reference designation system. He also um, explains about this and is using this also for this automated workflow, which um, he is presenting in his paper. So, we see, see, see here, he also based his presentation on GraphML or this um, automated workflow on GraphML, which derives information from the so-called node list, which can be also provided by the electronic data sheet in can open or can open device. Furthermore, he is addressing um, the problem with the device screen coordinates, which are appropriate ones. Therefore, he described a solution with regard to computer added manual assignment for device screen coordinates, which have been merged to the GraphML project file. So, um, in general, the workflow he is presenting here is compatible with the most common can open and application development tools in the market. So, this is the topic presented by Dr. Heike Saha. So, this was a summarization with regard to this section. Any questions related to this? This seems not the case as well. Then once again, I would hand over to Olga. Okay, there are in the ICC proceedings, uh, there are also some CANFD related papers. Uh, very important is the paper from Tony Adams. He describes in detail uh, the CAN signal improvement um, transceivers and how to design five megabit networks. Uh, this paper has already been as uh, an, extra, uh, uh, an abstract has been published in the last uh, CAN newsletter, so you can read this also there. Uh, but the entire paper is here with all the background information, uh, which has not been find its way into the uh, CAN newsletter magazine. Uh, most important maybe is that we also have considered uh, the uh, EMC uh, uh, issue, uh, which is standardized also in IEC for networks, and this is a general approach here. And you, he gives a lot of guidelines uh, how to design such uh, systems. Uh, Johnny Hancock from Keysight, he looks uh, in his paper to some physical layer issues on KNFD, how you can measure things, and um, I think this is also a valuable paper uh, describing more or less how to use uh, uh, oscilloscopes uh, into, um, in this and how to measure things. And if something is not working that proper, then you can detect where all the problems and how to solve the problems. Uh, a completely different uh, paper is given by Fred Rennick. Uh, this is a uh, from STM, and this is a lightweight communication bus based on KNFD. For those which are familiar with the SLIO concept in the early days of KN, this looks very similar. 
So we drop all those functionality which we don't need in the uh, Kane FD controller, in particular the uh, timing issues and uh, uh, those things. And then we have a master slave system. And the intention is to use this in, for example, complex uh, lighting systems uh, and other sensor and actuator oriented uh, low level uh, systems where you don't need all the KNFD communication, but you'd still want to have the reliability and uh, the same software running, but without uh, maybe the high accuracy as uh, in, in other, uh, in, in classical KNFD solutions. We have uh, formed a working group for that. So we will discuss uh, the, um, this issue in uh, one of the CIA groups. And I think it's starting next month so that we will have the, some communication. And this is for a high volume application like lighting and maybe uh, climate uh, and, and air conditioning applications and other those uh, applications where you need KNFD for a larger payload, but you don't want to, to pay uh, the um, price uh, for the complex controller. Last but not least, uh, in this uh, Ken FD related papers, there's a paper from uh, Ken Lennartson. He describes uh, how to improve Ken transceiver chips and how to measure things. Uh, he has presented this, uh, or he presented this uh, also on base of uh, the company which has good experience in Ken. And also this is uh, some, some interesting uh, approach where he goes back uh, to the basics and describe how to design things. I think all those uh, three papers from Tony Hancock and uh, Kent Lennerson are valuable for those which really want uh, to design physical layer for KNFD networks. Just this is in brief, we are running out of time and I think there's another uh, presentation by Reiner and uh, maybe this is also interesting in particular the security issue. Are there questions? At least not in the chat, but I think uh, we follow your recommendation that we continue with the last part and then we have another uh, possibility to ask for the questions. Um, so I will continue with uh, the presentation of Mr. Schumann, also from Canon Automation. Mr. Schumann in his presentation uh, provides a short recapitulation about the embedded security. Um, he introduces the three standards dealing for different application fields uh, with cybersecurity. So you see here the ISO 27001 for IT, the IC 62443 for industrial applications, and the ISO 21431 for automotive use cases. So he pointed out that these uh, standards do not specify any technology um, as such to solve the problem of cybersecurity, but define processes and procedures to classify security threats and to cope with them. And this you see here, he addresses the standards, gave a short introduction, then he um, explains what to be considered, what are the threat models, um, what are the assets, what are the attack vectors, um, what about the life cycle with the stakeholders, uh, up to dismantling of the products and what are the corresponding countermeasures. So this summary on security basics is provided by Mr. Schumann in his uh, speech. Subsequently to this, we have uh, the presentation from Professor Sikora from the um, University of Offenburg. So we see it here, achieving multi-level CAN FD security by complementing available technologies. So that, that had been presented by Mr. Schumann is now mapped to a real-life application, an elevator lift application. And here they are discussing um, the security for embedded devices, that this is typically an optimization between using the latest and most powerful security controls on the one hand, and on the other hand that you have to deal with limited resources, limited resources in memory, performance, bandwidth, and so on. And then how to, to live with this, and 
to evaluate what can you achieve with which kind of security control. And when we browse through this paper briefly, then you see here um, the typical application, here typical lift application, there may be some device or some part of the, cap uh, of the application in a safe cabin, other parts are a little bit more open, other parts of the application are connected via uh, cloud services, and this entire application you have to have in mind, they are discussing the attack options, the local ones, the remote ones, and furthermore, they are discussing then the available security controls, so like whitelisting, blacklisting, so-called IP guarding, what you can, can you achieve with that, what can you achieve by developing and mapping or introducing a so-called cryptographical layer that you um, can uh, maybe group some parts together, maybe share secrets, and at the end, um, what you can achieve by pairing devices but that are maybe also one part is remote controlled or somewhere cloud connected. So these things they are discussing and complementing measures um, and finally giving some design recommendations. And um, also in this direction thinking about um, that security in embedded application field is often a kind of trade-off between technical possibilities and nice to have features on the one hand and on the other hand some limitations derived from the resources is provided then by uh, Ms. Elshani from Infineon. One moment. So Ms. Elshani is um, coming back to that topic that we have started from, the CanXL, make CanXL secure. And she says, okay, we have now also for the automotive use case some security solutions like SecOC, for example. But nevertheless, also here in these kind of solutions, we have to look for some trade-offs with a limited payload of classical CAN and CANFD. But now when we think about can XL, then we can rid of this trade, can get rid of this trade-offs and can design something new that is also capable to encrypt the data content. And this is then this developed uh, CIDSEC protocol developed and presented here by Infineon. And this proposal for CanXL security provides authentication, integration, and as I emphasize, confidentiality from the data link layer upwards. So I enlarge a little bit that you can see it also maybe on your screen that you see here how they are using the XL frame. They indicate somehow on the control field via a certain bit or bit pattern that they provide encrypted content and then the content itself comes then with a header. They are using the data field in a specific way. You have here the header identifying now the control information and the parameter for security operation and you have also a MAC, a message or the authentication code. And with regards to this control information, you have here a version number specifying the version of the CANSEC protocol, the security association configuration, which shows which part of the frame is used to select a secure association and you have the cipher mode. So this is provided and introduced by Ms. Ashani in, his, in her paper. And additionally, we have two further presentations dealing more with um, the topic engineering, let's say. So on the one hand from Dr. Quigley. So Dr. Quigley is presenting benchmarking of CAN systems using the physical layer in car, truck, and marine case studies. So he is analyzing something that we have also heard about in the environment of security. It's the analysis of the CAN message fingerprint. So if you see it here, any message has a specific CAN message signature. So the voltage levels on the CAN high line and CAN low line are in a specific way depending on the fact who is the sender of this message. 
So this comes from <coughs> sorry, this comes from the physical makeup of the canvas. Um, this comes from the used components within the ECU and the wiring characteristics and the age. And this ends up in the fact that we see here the voltage levels that we can measure uh, are very specific depending on which device is the sender and they are in common more or less for all the messages which are sent by one device. So we see here, here the can high line uh, is always for a dominant bit at about um, 3.5 volts. Here at this device it is a little bit lower and if we make a kind of plot for all the messages that have been transmitted then we see okay we have a certain grouping there are messages with a similar characteristic and we can learn from this okay these devices are most probably created by the very same device so if I have to do some re-engineering, for example, I have not really the K-matrix, which messages are sent by which device, then I have to figure out it by myself, and this could be one possibility to do so. As I've already said, we have heard about this already in the environment of security, that I want to make sure that a real, that a real intended device is providing this message and not some uh, false, uh, in, or false friend who is introduced and is now faking some messages. So this is provided in the presentation by Mr. Quigley. He presents then some use cases. And finally, the last presentation is by Mr. Servas. So Mr. Servas presents us um, in his presentation the design of a CAN to TSN Ethernet gateway. So um, in this approach we see here we have on the one hand one or several CAN controllers. They might be of classical CAN or CAN FD. And on the other hand we have Ethernet and we each CAN port is associated to a specific destination and source UDP port. So this is then uh, provided here or in his speech. So this way messages from a CAN port are forwarded to the destination IP address and UDP port and are marked as coming from the source UDP port which are associated with a specific CAN port. So we see here furthermore that we can forward a single CAN message or several CAN messages. This comes here later on in the CAN frame encapsulation. We had in the already mentioned um, higher layer task for some KNXL now some discussion. How could we tunnel, for example, via KNXL um, CAN messages? Here, this is already more or less described um, for in this uh, paper defining uh, a gateway between CAN and TSN. So furthermore, in this paper, they have discussed uh, the issue with regard to latency time where it says without CAN frame grouping, the latency is less than 30 microseconds. So CAN frame grouping is here discussed, puts another latency on uh, this uh, mechanism because you have to wait till all the CAN frames um, have been received and then you can send your TSN message. And as is described in this paper, the implementation that is uh, provided here by Mr. Servas um, is also capable now to support several network architectures. Um, he describes for several reasons it can be wise to connect the gateway to the very same, with several interfaces to the very same canvas, to the several networks, and to allow such heterogeneous and complex architectures or even this Ethernet ring. Yeah, so much in brief with regard to these further um, engineering topics and other topics. So, a final question from my side and also from Holger's side. Do you have any questions to that what we have presented? And maybe while you are thinking about some last questions, um, I'd like to give you the hint that um, these um, in the ICC proceedings that they are available for purchase at Canon Automation Office. So you have the possibility here to write an email to 
secretary at k-cr.org and there you can order your personalized version of this International Cane Conference proceedings and we strongly hope that we can also see the presentations to these um, interesting papers uh, hopefully next year when we can have them the International Cane Conference. So, one last question from my side. Are there any questions? This seems not the case. So, I give you a last chance for finding some. Um, if you want to get stay informed about what is Canon Automation doing, so we provide regularly a kind of mailing for Canon Automation non members. We provide the Canon Info Mail, which appears monthly. So we inform what's going on in the CAN community, what are latest developments in the application field of CAN, what progress um, has been made in our working groups. So um, here you can stay informed. If you uh, want to stay, stay informed, then please register for this info mailing if you are not have done yet. For our members, we have uh, some more um, information from our member space also available in our members news, also appearing regularly one email per month. Furthermore, we try to be available on our social media channels. You can follow us there as well. Um, in the times of Corona, it's a little bit more difficult to meet us on the fairs. We had intended to be part of uh, several trade shows, but um, to be honest, I'm not really sure which of those will really take place this year. Uh, but um, you see uh, the planned and intended one. And if you say, oh, it's also nice to hear in person from Holger, from me or other uh, CAN automation people what's uh, going on in the CAN application field, you see here our lineup of the next CR webinars. Yeah, so um, I would uh, appreciate if I could uh, welcome you once again in our, one of our webinars. And a final question, do you have any questions? Okay, so if not, then I thank you very much for attending this webinar. I hope um, it has been interested for you. Thank you, Olga, for supporting. And I wish you a good evening. Thank you very much. Bye.